Good morning. I would like to welcome everyone here to worship this morning. Bye. 
final scripture reading for this morning is found in Genesis 24, 34 through 38, 42 through 49, and 58 through 67. So the servant said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I came today to the spring and said, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make my ma if now if you only make successful the way I am going, I am standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went out to the spring and drew. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will water your camels also. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethel to Nahor's son, to whom Milcah bore him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. And then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who, let, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you will deal loyally and truly, and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me so that I may turn either to the right or to the left. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse along with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went on his way. Now Isaac had come from Beth Bethelarhairo and was settled in Nejeb. And Isaac went out into the evening to walk in the field. And looking up, he saw the camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camels and said to the servant, Who is the man over there, walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. And so she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her to his mother Sarah's tent. He took to Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So once again, good morning. I would normally introduce myself, but the majority of you have known me since I was born, or at the very least, since I was much shorter than I am now. But for the rest of you, my name is Claire Kennedy. I'm 20 years old. I'm a junior at University of the Ozarks studying religion and English. I'm planning on going to seminary, and this last semester I started visiting grad schools which is weird and amazing because I've been planning this for five years and suddenly it's actually happening. I love what I do, I love what I study, I love the people that are around me. Now, as a college student looking at grad school, writing intellectual scholarly articles and papers for research projects, you might wonder what I do for fun. Well, as intellectual as my friends and I are, on Monday night we get together for girls' night and we watch The Bachelorette. Now, for those of you who have missed out on this particular cultural phenomenon, The Bachelorette is a reality TV show where one bachelorette is chosen, typically beautiful, successful, and college-educated, and a bunch of guys who are typically not quite on her level are brought together for her to hopefully find love amongst them. 
There's also a bachelor season, but no one ever likes the bachelors. There's not really much point to talk about it. <laughs> it is as ridiculous as it sounds, and I'm not sure anyone actually thinks love and a successful marriage will come out of it. But it is a good excuse on a Monday night to get together with your friends, eat junk food, laugh about things, and see footage of beautiful places around the world. I will admit that the story of Isaac and Rebecca sounds as about a good chance at finding love and a happy marriage as The Bachelorette. And yet, somehow, it does. In spite of our modern ideas about love and about marriage and relationships and what those should look like, this marriage, albeit flawed like all of them, is one of love. This is what the end of this passage tells us. Isaac loved her. Unplanned, unexpected, Rebecca goes to the well for water and returns with a God-ordained call. We can imagine her confusion, though it likely wasn't pleasant. I can only imagine how I would have felt if I went to get water, met a stranger, after giving him a drink, and he suddenly started putting fancy gold jewelry on me with no explanation, and then asked if he could see my family. Abraham, Isaac, the servant of Abraham, God, all of these seem to have an understanding of what the purpose is here and what exactly this story is about. It is Rebecca who comes into this as she does every day, going for water, not knowing what is about to unfold, and yet she responds with kindness and enthusiasm, offering a stranger water, giving his camels something to drink, and when asked, saying, cheerfully and willingly, I will go. Rebecca goes, without the full story, without all the information, but trusting in the direction that the Lord is taking her. Now, I'm not saying that we should all be like Rebecca and go wait by a well until a stranger gives you jewelry and takes you home, but what if we responded to God's call in our lives in the same way? Like Rebecca, we are not the ones who have the full story, we do not get the insider information like the servant did. Yet how would it be different if we reacted to and responded to these kinds of sacred well encounters with the trust and enthusiasm of Rebecca? It is easy to doubt. It is easy to wait until we know more, to prefer to hold off until we can get all of the facts and know what it is that we are supposed to be doing. It is much harder to feel the hand of God in your life directing you to the place you do not know, to a life you have never experienced, and to do the most simple thing of all. Just go. This chapter in Genesis is full of people trusting in God's provision. Abraham is confident that a wife for his son will be found. The servant trusts that God is, li is listening and will give him a sign. But it is Rebecca who trusts when she is the one with the most to lose. It is only Rebecca who must leave behind everything that is known, everything that is familiar and safe, and go to marry a man that she has never met. It is Rebecca who has something to lose, and Rebecca who goes in abundant faith that God is guiding her towards a future that is good, that the Lord has a plan to give her hope and a future. She does not yet know why she is being sent. She does not yet know Isaac, that she will be loved, that she will have sons. But she goes of her own choice, and knowing that she will be provided for, for this is the path the Lord has directed her on. Perhaps it helps that Rebecca does not appear to be a stranger to love. She has an unusual amount of agency here. She goes to the well, seemingly, for the most part, unsupervised. And when she t speaks with her parents, they give her the option does she wish to go, or would she rather stay? And it is her choice to go. And go she does, from one love to another, just as we are and just as we do. Wherever we are in this moment, whatever burdens or confusions or conditions this world provides, we live with the unconditional love of our Lord, and we are blessed with the thriving love from this church and from each other. But like Rebecca, we are not called to a love that is still, that remains in one place that is comfortable and known and familiar. Instead, we are called to a love that is greater still, 
but asks us to let go of these familiar things and trust that God is in the unknown that we cannot yet see. That love is not possible to find when we stay where we are. It is not that somehow where we are, where we are known, where it is familiar, where we are comfortably loved in a familiar way is somehow bad. It isn't. It has been what we have needed, but we are called towards a love that is active, that is in service, and that asks us to give up our comfort in return for something more. And like Rebecca, God asks us to go, without the facts, to go without the familiar. Go and trust that God will meet you where you are and be where it is that you are going. According to Bible study tools, Rebecca's name means a quarrel appeased. Rebecca's call was not into a place of comfort. She was called in the comp into the complex knots and tangles of a family that is grieving. The loss of a wife, the loss of a mother, a loved one, a life that was long and well-lived, but whose absence is keenly felt. When I studied this passage in Old Testament at Ozarks, our professor pointed us towards a moment earlier in Genesis that is not referenced, but is lying beneath the text and must be remembered to be understood in this family. The moment where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac is shown in Genesis to share a moment of brotherly love with Ishmael. His close relationship with his mother is established and grieved with its loss. But we see very little about Isaac and Abraham. And so we must think of whether this moment is remembered, of whether this is the moment that stands between father and son. Though Abraham did not go through with the, the sacrifice, surely that wound is still there, a quarrel needing to be appeased with hope and comfort and love. It says that with Rebecca, Isaac was comforted. Rebecca was called from her peace and comfort, not to another place of peace, but to a place of conflict, of grief, of her unknown. She brought the peace and comfort with her. This was not somehow forced upon her. This mingling coexistence of grief and comfort was chosen by both Isaac and Rebecca. Rebecca chose to go and Isaac loved her. Their mutual call was not complete without the other. In the same way, if we exist only in comfort and peace, then we are not where we are called to be. And if we are Isaac and we see only our grief, we must trust as well that we are not at our story's end. There will be something more. The complex, complicated work of following God asks us to have both. The comfort of pain gives us purpose, but perhaps the grief gives us a greater depth of love. But we must choose, as Rebecca did, to go ourselves, not to be forced dragging our feet, but to go of our choosing, trusting and rejoicing in the provision of God, knowing that we will not be called to a future without hope. Where there is only grief, there is not hope. Where there is only comfort, there is no purpose. It is only when we find the place where these two aspects of ourselves can coexist that we have found where we are called to go. We want to think that if we have a hope and a future, then it must mean that God's plan for our lives does not involve suffering. But we can only think that if we think that these two things are opposite. When more realistically, we must realize that hope can only exist where there has been suffering. C.S. Lewis says, Try to exclude the possibility of suffering which the order of nature and the existence of free wills involve, and you find that you have excluded life itself. And we are not called away from life, but further into it, taking our joys, our hopes, our sufferings farther into the life that we are called to love in. Isaac's grief was not his natural state not the place where he was called to be. His name meant laughter, a sound of exuberant joy, a state that was returned with the love and comfort of Rebecca and the faithful purpose of the God he followed. 
Rachel Held Evans says in her book, Searching for Sunday, imagine if every church became a place where everyone is safe, but no one is comfortable. Imagine if every church became a place where we told one another the truth. Maybe we could create sanctuary. This is our purpose. Same as Rebecca and Isaac. Leave what is comfortable and bring comfort. Let go of your grief and respond in joy. Go, follow where you are led. Answer when you are called. Enthusiastically, without all the facts, but trusting that you are following the voice of a God who loves you and will provide for you. As a church and as followers of Christ, this is our role in the world so that others can see us going, see our faith, see our joy and fo in following an unexplainable God into an unknowable future and see the amazing world-changing love that has led us to do so. Amen.